Welcome to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcasts. The EU's enlargement process is back in the spotlight. But how does it work? And what are the challenges ahead, both for candidate countries and for the EU itself? Stay with us, and we'll walk you through the ins and outs of this strategic process. This is a historic moment. The decision is made. Uh, we open negotiations with uh, Ukraine and with Moldova. Uh, we grant status to uh, Georgia. And this uh, decision made by the uh, member states uh, is extremely important for the credibility of the European Union. This was the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, announcing this much-awaited decision after the meeting of EU leaders in December 2023. The decision to start accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova, as well as to grant candidate status to Georgia, was recommended by the European Commission in November, with strong backing from the European Parliament. During the summit, EU leaders also showed their will to open accession negotiations with Bosnia and Herzegovina, but postponed the decision till March this year. It was a crucial summit for the EU's future enlargement. But let's recap a bit. EU membership is open to any European country that respects the EU's democratic values and meets the political, economic and other accession criteria to join the club. And the prospect of membership is a powerful stimulus for democratic and economic reforms in the candidate countries. Currently, there are nine recognised candidates. The five Western Balkans countries, with Kosovo still waiting to be accepted as candidate, plus Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, since recently, and Turkey. However, since Croatia's accession in 2013, not a single country has joined the Union, and the Balkan countries have made little progress towards EU integration. The most advanced in their accession negotiations, Montenegro and Serbia, started the process more than 10 years ago. North Macedonia and Albania opened accession negotiations only in 2022, and talks with Turkey are on ice. This sort of enlargement fatigue has affected the credibility of the European Union and opened the door to the influence of countries like Russia and China in the Western Balkans region. Also, since Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia asked to join the EU in 2022, the geopolitical dimension of enlargement, which includes security and defence, but also foreign policy alignment, became even more pronounced. So all this led to a fundamental rethinking of enlargement policy. Aware of the risks of inaction and the need to give countries in the Western Balkans a credible EU perspective, the European Commission adopted in 2020 an updated methodology for accession negotiations, making the process less technical and more merit-based, with greater political steer and a stronger focus on key reforms. But some think tanks believe this has had no real impact and have made more radical proposals for stage accession. We spoke about this with Michael Emerson from the Centre for European Policy Studies. On the enlargement package of last November, there were two good things, but two buts. It's good to open negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova, but the 50 billion aid package for Ukraine absolutely needs to be passed, without which Ukraine will fail. It was good to see the growth plan initiative for the Western Balkans proposed by the Commission, but this needs to be properly integrated with the formal enlargement methodology. If not, it just means an enhanced association arrangement, not membership. But accession negotiations are not only about candidate countries undertaking the necessary reforms. The EU has its own homework. Stay with us. To expand and still function efficiently, the EU needs to adjust its policies, budget, structure and the way decisions are taken. And these are serious challenges. New members will mean demand for new resources to cover additional costs, especially for the agricultural and cohesion policies. According to the Council of the EU, the cost of accession of all current candidates over seven years would amount to about 257 billion euros. That is 37 billion euros a year if current rules apply. This would leave less money available for current member states should the rules remain the same. So, to ensure the continuation of EU support for all regions, new and old, new rules will be necessary. 
Agricultural support is another contentious issue. Here's Antonio Albaladejo Roman from the European Parliamentary Research Service. Agricultural policy represents a third of the EU's budget, so it's always a difficult chapter in enlargement negotiations. It will be no doubt the same in the next enlargement round, especially as concerns Ukraine. But it's too early for predictions, since everything will depend on three things. The future shape of EU agricultural policy, its budget and the conditions of Ukraine's EU membership. Another challenge concerns candidate countries' alignment with EU foreign policy. Here's Jakob Przetachnik from the European Parliamentary Research Service. EU member states have to align with EU statements, take part in EU actions and apply agreed sanctions. And candidate countries' alignment differ widely. While many of them have very high level of alignment, others not. Serbia, for example, has not aligned with majority of EU statements on Russia and Ukraine. In result, overall alignment level was assessed at 51%. This figure is even lower for Turkey, 10%. The security and defense implications of enlargement also need consideration, especially in the light of Russia's war on Ukraine. Very much like NATO's Article 5, the mutual defense clause in Article 42 of the Treaty of the European Union grants a member state victim of armed aggression the right to aid and mutual assistance from all other member states. Securing good neighborly relations and solving disputes, for instance, between Kosovo and Serbia, and within Bosnia and Herzegovina is also extremely important for accession negotiations to be able to progress. Because ultimately, enlargement is about securing peace, stability and prosperity in our continent. That's why the European Parliament is such a strong believer in this process and has qualified Ukraine's future membership as an investment in a united and strong Europe. Here's Michael Gala, member of the European Parliament. Ukraine has advanced a lot in spite of the dreadful war of aggression from the Russian side. Since the revolution of dignity, it has been on this track of reforms. And since it has been made a uh, candidate to the European Union, they have further uh, forged ahead and uh, delivered in multifold respects, such as this in the areas of uh, fighting against corruption and rule of law. But enlargement is also about the EU's vision for its future and what kind of global power it aims to be, especially in the context of Russia's war in Ukraine and the shifts in global geopolitical alliances. Want to know more? Check out Branislav Stanicek and Jakob Pshetachnik's full policy brief on the EPRS website or in our app. This is a European Parliamentary Research Service podcast. Thanks for listening.